thank you very much, Kyle. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my slideshow to get us started here. Um, this evening, um, as Kyle mentioned, this is the 158th anniversary of the, the single bloodiest day in American history, uh, the Battle of Antietam. Uh, worse than, than all of the other things uh, that we've had in our history and uh, something that I think with all the, the turmoil and, and unrest to today, uh, it's good to go back and look at really a, a much, much greater uh, threat to our country and a, a history that we should never forget. So tonight we're gonna to talk about specifically uh, Melvin Clark, the gentleman in the bottom left-hand uh, picture there, uh, who was the uh, original builder and owner of the castle up there in your top left-hand corner. Uh, and his um, connection with the 36th Ohio, the raising of that unit and their history as they marched toward Antietam. So who was Melvin Clark? Um, Melvin Calvin Clark was the first owner, as I said before, of, of the castle. Um, like a lot of other Marietta residents, he was uh, of New England extraction. Most of the early settlers here in Southeastern Ohio, specifically here in Marietta, uh, came from New England and, and Colonel Clark was no, no exception. Uh, his mother, uh, Roxana Alden Clark, was a direct descendant of John Alden, which many of you might recognize as the youngest signer of the Mayflower Compact, which I have a little example of there in the center of your picture. So one of those original Mayflower and Puritan families. Uh, a few details of, of Melvin and his, his second wife, uh, Sophia, both of which lived here at the castle. Uh, as I said, he was born in Massachusetts, was a teacher, uh, turned into a lawyer when he moved to, to Ohio, uh, specifically up to the McConnellsville and Malta area in Morgan County, just up the Muskingum River from us. After his first wife died, after having one son, um, he remarried a local girl from just uh, a few minutes south of us in Belpre, uh, Sophia Browning Clark. Uh, she has a pretty interesting uh, family history as well. Uh, she is um, the great. Uh, she is the granddaughter of the. Um, uh, I'm sorry, great granddaughter of General Rufus Putnam, the leader of the original 48 founders of Marietta, as well as the granddaughter of Colonel Joseph Barker. Uh, both of those gentlemen are featured in the the latest David McCullough book about the settlement of Marietta called the Pioneers, and I would certainly recommend that particular uh, book for your perusal. Uh, the family itself, uh, he had a fairly small family. Uh, again, he had one son from the first marriage who would follow him into the service. Uh, he was a student at the Naval Academy, but, but left that, um, that institution to come back here and enlist in the service for 100 days. Unfortunately, he was killed uh, like his father Melvin uh, later on in the war. Uh, during a, a terrible explosion and sabotage incident in City Point, Virginia. Uh, from his second wife, Sophia, uh, he had three children. There's a little bit of details in there. Uh, you can um, see some, some very interesting uh, later in life type of things with lynchings and cattle rustling, things of that sort. Um, an interesting family altogether, but we don't have time to go into all those different details. Uh, the Clark family um, purchased the property here at the castle in 1855, uh, and construction began later that year. Uh, but by July of 1858, uh, the Clark family was still growing. Uh, there was Sophia and Melvin, along with an 11-year-old Joseph, uh, and two new children, Harry and Arthur. Uh, Harry was two months or two years old, and uh, Arthur just 11 months. Uh, but by July of 1858, um, John Newton uh, made a proposition to Melvin to buy this place for his new bride that was he was going to be married in within a couple of weeks. And the family was growing and needed a new place to go. Melvin and, and the family would move uh, just a couple of blocks away from here to a house, a uh, very ornate and beautiful home on the 300 block of Washington Street here in Marietta. Uh, it's no longer existing. Uh, 
It's now the present day site of the Washington Street Apartments. Uh, it, after uh, the, the Clark family eventually left that home, it became the, the home of William Cutler, the, the U.S. Congressman and uh, son of Judge Ephraim Cutler. Again, another one of those characters in the David McCullough book. Uh, however, while he was here at the, uh, the Clark residence on Washington Street, he had his fourth and fi final child, Francis, born in June of 1861. So just a couple months after the beginning of the war. The, the big event, of course, is in April, uh, April the 12th of 1861 with the firing on Fort Sumter. And then less than a week later, um, the state of Virginia, which there's a, an interesting map showing the, the combined states of current, current states of West Virginia and Virginia to dig, together there in 1861. Uh, caused obviously uh, a lot of turmoil here in Marietta because uh, for folks that look it up on the map uh, that don't live here, uh, our neighbors uh, just a couple of blocks from here are, uh, are the state of Virginia in 1861 over in Williamstown. Um, as I said, Melvin uh, was a lawyer, uh, originally a teacher turned lawyer. Uh, moved to Marietta, uh, attended the, the first congregation church, which you see here, uh, but he was also the city solicitor, basically the law director of Marietta. But in on that same day, and on April the 17th, 1861, when Virginia seceded, um, the prosecuting attorney for Washington County, a gentleman in the top left, a man by the name of Captain Frank Buell, uh, a cousin of Don Carlos Buell, the, the famous general, of the Civil War, uh, who grew up in Lowell, just about 20 minutes outside of Marietta. Um, he and his uh, first company of men called the Union Blues met in the church. Um, and uh, as the home news, the local newspaper described the occasion, it was a most affecting scene, which our city has never beheld. Family and friends of the volunteers gathered on the commons, which is Muskingum Park today in front of the Congregational Church. Mothers and sisters with tearful eyes were there to take what might be the final leave of these young soldiers as they boarded the steamer Lizzie Martin and headed up the Muskingum River. Uh, before embarking, they were presented with a silk flag sewn by the ladies of Marietta. Uh, and a very patriotic speech was given by Melvin Clark, the local lawyer, which was responded to by Captain Buell, who earnestly pledged that the flag would never be disgraced. As a side note, uh, Captain Buell uh, would lose his life at the Battle of Freeman's Ford just before the Battle of Second Bull Run. Uh, just a few days later, uh, there was a great alarm here in Marietta, as this newspaper account uh, will detail. A letter was written to uh, Governor William Dennison up in Columbus talking about a, a group of rebel troops that were rumored to be on their way to our neighbors, uh, just about 20 minutes uh, drive south of here in Parkersburg, which was Virginia at the time, uh, which was the main uh, railroad depot for the B&O. And uh, as a member of the local militia, uh, Melvin Clark, as you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, on Major General Hildebrand's staff, uh, wrote off this letter imploring the governor to send troops to um, protect not only the railroad, but protect the people of Washington County. Um, that commander, his commanding officer at that particular time was Jesse Hildebrand, who some locals might uh, recognize. He uh, would go on to become a Colonel of the 77th Ohio. Uh, at the age of 62, he enlisted um, and, and served with that unit at the Battle of Shiloh and defended uh, the Shiloh Church, for which the battle gets its name. Uh, there were um, wonderful heroic actions there at the, at the Shiloh Church, helped really to save the career uh, of uh, future Union generals and, and the household names of Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman by holding out for a couple of hours against overwhelming odds so more troops could be brought to the forefront. Uh, in, um, in July of 1861, um, the Washington County Military Committee, which Melvin was a part of in those very early months of the war, 
um, started raising troops. And while serving in that capacity, along with John Newton, uh, the future owner who purchased it, the, the castle from Melvin, um, those men served on that committee. Uh, Melvin's wife, Sophia, wrote this, this particular passage after the war, talking about the internal struggle which was growing in Melvin in those early months. Uh, she quotes, here it was felt that Washington County being the place of first settlement in Ohio ought to stand in the front ranks in the early and full enlistment of Ohio. Colonel Clark felt a great desire that Ohio should do her full share in filling up the army. When a man had decided to ask others to peril their, li peril their lives for their country's cause, he has, of course, decided that that cause demands the imperiling of his own. It was, it was so with Mr. Clark. He often said and wrote that he felt it to be his, quote, imperative duty to join the army. And as such, when a telegram arrived here in, on July the 23rd of 1861 from Congressman William uh, Cutler asking that a new unit be raised, uh, Melvin started that process and started recruiting for the 36th Ohio. And you see one of the recruiting uh, posters uh, for Company A that was done at Lowell. Uh, the 36th formed uh, just um, about six or seven blocks from the castle down at the end of Front Street uh, at the Washington County Fairgrounds. And he and his men started rallying there and forming the Union. It was called Camp Putnam, named for the Revolutionary War General and Sophia's great-grandfather, uh, Rufus Putnam. Very early on, uh, as a man of, of great knowledge and, and um, education, uh, but little military experience other than the militia, Melvin decided to uh, pull in a Harmer soldier uh, named Benjamin Fearing, who was a veteran of the first Battle of Bull Run, who had come back to Harmer and back to Marietta uh, and tapped him as the acted, acting adjutant to help drill and train these raw troops and uh, give some uh, added experience to the recruiting, the, the recruiting process. Close it up here, okay. So the 36th uh, trained there for uh, a, a very short while before moving just down river again to Parkersburg that I referred to earlier in what's now West Virginia, drawing from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper in August of 64, 61. Uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, view of Parkersburg with the, the large, um, heavily packed steamboat pulling up to the wharf, uh, loaded with troops coming to uh, be posted there at, uh, at Parkersburg in this large building here, which was the railroad station depot with the flag atop of it, became the headquarters uh, that Melvin Clark moved into. Uh, when they eventually moved on from there to their duty stations, uh, they were, the, the residents of Parkersburg were not, I, I regret to say, um, sorry to see them go. Uh, there were a number of incidents in town, uh, particularly involving uh, alcohol and as a result, um, a temperance supporter in, of Mr. Clark's uh, background uh, confiscated all of the liquor in town in Parkersburg. Uh, it's a very long story and something for another day, but a very amusing uh, thing today to look at. Not so amusing for the residents of Parkersburg. Uh, just a quick uh, background on some of the men that would join the cause of the 36th. I, I think of, of all the research I've done here, certainly some of the best led and, and some of the, the strongest uh, men and, and uh, citizens of Washington County were recruited into the 36th Ohio. As you see on the left, uh, Hiram Fosdick Duvall of uh, Waterford uh, fully financed the raising of his 100 men company of Company A and joining uh, James Gage Barker, uh, the grandson of uh, Colonel Joseph Barker to help recruit men from the Duvall and Lowell area just outside of Marietta. Um, Duvall would go on to lead the 36th in the latter part of the war as both Colonel and eventually Brevet Brigadier General. I will mention both men 
uh, would uh, be wounded during their service, but would survive. Uh, and, and really, um, some of my favorites, uh, the brothers, uh, Captain Jewett Palmer on the left and his brother John on the right, both from the lower Salem area, about a 20 minute drive north of Marietta in Washington County. Both were very staunch abolitionists. Uh, their father was an underground railroad conductor in the lower Salem area. And uh, were Jewett, especially as the captain, was very outspoken in the cause. Um, was very heavily involved in politics after the war and eventually became the mayor of Marietta. Uh, the gentleman in the, in the middle might look familiar to a few of you. Uh, that is William Lloyd Garrison, who is a cousin to the Palmers, uh, the uh, very radical anti-slavery advocate and the uh, publisher of the Liberator, the anti-slavery newspaper. Uh, after the, uh, the unit uh, under Colonel Clark, uh, again, he was Lieutenant Colonel at the time, uh, left Parkersburg and headed farther south down toward the Charleston, uh, West Virginia area. Uh, many of the officers, including Clark, really needed um, and requested a military man of, of long experience to join their unit to lead them into battle. And while they were going through that particular process, uh, Governor Dennison, back up in Columbus, Ohio, um, had a man walk into his office, a West Pointer uh, from Dayton uh, by the name of George Crook uh, from the class of 1843 at West Point. And he certainly turned out to be the right man for the right job for the right unit. Has a, that very distinctive um, beard as well with the two pointed beard there. Again, they were posted uh, more in the central part of in the early part of their service in that first year, specifically out of Summersville, uh, West Virginia, uh, along the Gauley River, for folks that are familiar with that area. Uh, and from September of 1861 until about May of 1862, uh, Crook often sent the men out on multi-day expedi expeditions, chasing the rebels um, through the rugged mountains of Appalachia. If you've ever driven down in that particular area, you know it's, it's pretty rough terrain, uh, even today. Uh, they did lots of operations in the surrounding area of Braxton and Webster, Pocahontas County, Greenbrier and Fayette, um, using Summersville as kind of their base of operations. It was an absolutely terrible assignment uh, for the men. And I won't go into a lot of detail uh, on this particular talk, but it was largely composed of tr lots of training, uh, but also lots of missions and expeditions uh, to um, inter interdict a lot of irregular forces of the Confederacy. And uh, they were heavily involved in what we would today term as guerrilla warfare. One of the really unique things and why I put this particular slide together um, is they had something that was, uh, you know, I hate to use the word unique, but it was certainly a unique thing. Uh, everyone uses the word, uh, overuses the word, but this was certainly a, a, a unique structure that was built by the men of the 36th Ohio. While most of the, the Civil War soldiers during the winter would go into winter quarters and not do a whole lot, including drilling on a daily basis. The 36th Ohio was kind of a, a glaring exception to that rule. Under Colonel Crook, he wanted to have these men more highly trained. And so upon arriving in, in Summersville, they found a local inoperable sawmill just outside of the town of Summersville that with a lot of engineering and mechanical skills of some of the men of the 36, they had up and running within a couple of days, sawing some, um, some timber and started constructing houses. And in this case, a very enormous uh, drill hole uh, that they could do things during the winter using this particular facility. As you see on the slide, and with this representation of uh, a, a rendering of two football fields stacked end to end, plus about another 20 feet. Uh, I chose the, the Marietta College uh, rendering of their football field here. Um, it was 740 feet long. 
by 33 feet wide. So about the end of the numbers on the football field to the hash marks uh, for fo football fans out there. And uh, this enormous uh, drill hall would get about 400 men stacked shoulder to shoulder from one end to the other, 400. And then they would have a second rank behind them of another 400. So almost having a full regiment being able to drill throughout the day in the dead of winter with the terrible weather there in Southern West Virginia. Um, the men um, really didn't like it, <laughs> that they were doing things differently than the other troops that were generally uh, had, the, had the, the winters off. Uh, but the thing that even more than the drilling in that huge drill hall, the thing that they despised the most, and there's very few photographs or, or existing pieces of this today that I'm aware of. Um, they had the highly despised, as I put here, the neck socks. Uh, this is something that a lot of folks are not aware of, but it was a training tool uh, used by the Army and, and particularly uh, a, a drill master like Colonel Crook. Uh, you would put these leather socks around your neck. It's like a very wide dog collar and it prevents you from looking down. So why would they wear these, you might ask. Um, it prevents you from looking at your feet as you're marching and doing maneuvers. It keeps your head up so you can see your surroundings, see things that are happening in front of you. It also gets you used to the movements of the men, both in front uh, and in back of you when you're doing maneuvers. Uh, it was a loath loathsome experience, as many of the men uh, described in terms that I can't uh, repeat here today uh, as a, a family friend, friendly program we have here. Uh, but the men realized uh, at the end of uh, the training sessions that all of this um, terribly annoying um, training patterns that they were going through became in years later and after a, a series of battles really uh, something that they look back on with, with great admiration for Colonel Crook, turned him into one of the most despised at the time that this training was happening to one of their most beloved commanders. Uh, for, for folks that were really interested in, in looking into that first year of service, I would certainly recommend, uh, there, there's four books here and I'll have this slide up at the end of the presentation as well for you to look at. Uh, I would certainly recommend the Civilian War in West Virginia by George Hall, uh, my friend from over in Parkersburg, who talks about um, the, the terrible duty that they had there and specifically that guerrilla warfare in the first year. Uh, a quick summary of that, and it's also talked about in, in those other two books, Lincoln's Army and Soldiers of the Union, uh, which have uh, soldiers' accounts in those. Um, that irregular warfare uh, involved uh, flat out murder between these irregular troops that were killing civilians and uh, sniping at the, the 36 and other troops in the Summersville area and the surrounding counties, uh, bushwhacking as they called it. And they would arrest these men, would send them off to, and, and there were a couple of women as well, they would send them off to jails and uh, detention facilities in the north uh, only to find out that the civilian and military authorities would not hold them and send them right back, uh, back to uh, Summersville and the surrounding areas where they would continue their uh, sniping and murder and chaos uh, activities. Uh, it didn't take long for that to um, change the warfare and specifically Colonel Crook's attitude, to, attitude toward that uh, to where he would start looking the other way when different events would happen and um, unofficially sanctioned, sanctioned some of those um, unmilitary-like uh, tactics to, to get rid of some of these forces. Um, particularly, uh, Captain Jewett Palmer, again, that staunch uh, zealot abolitionist, if you will, uh, a man all in for the war uh, effort to uh, abolish slavery and uh, put down the rebellion. As a result, a lot of those irregular forces, when they were captured and taken prisoner, would have a series of accidents on their way back to camp and on their way back to detention, uh, falling off horses and breaking their necks, uh, trip falling across streams and, and either drowning or hitting their heads on rocks. 
Um, but after a, a series of uh, dead prisoners, uh, most of that uh, irregular activity and chaos uh, either ceased or, or was reduced pretty substantially. As a result, um, they started mo moving on to more uh, regular type of activities. And eventually their very first battle at Lewisburg, uh, which is now West Virginia, on May the 23rd of 1862, um, after almost a year of irregular fighting, uh, they had their first shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder, uh, knockdown dragout fight. Uh, about 1,600 men under the overall command of Colonel Crook, who commanded a couple of different regiments. Uh, about 1,600 of them faced off outnumbered uh, against roughly 2,200 battle-hardened veterans of uh, General Harry Heath, um, a veteran uh, of the last couple of years, uh, was going into West Virginia and uh, went to do battle just outside of Lewisburg. Uh, just after 4.30 a.m. on the 23rd of May, uh, they drove in the Union pickets of the, the 36th, specifically Company C, just a few miles east of Lewisburg. Uh, they sent out Company G, Joint Palmer's unit, to reinforce the pickets along with a couple of other units. And um, the late war unit can be brought up to attack uh, the 36th fighting on the left of the line under Colonel Clark as the overall commander of the unit uh, with the overall command of both units under uh, Colonel Crook. Um, the the right-hand unit, the 44th Ohio, attacked the Confederates. Uh, the 36th, um, kind of an interesting side note, attacked the, the 22nd Virginia Infantry, the Confederate unit, under the command of Colonel George S. Patton, uh, the uh, grandfather of the famous World War II general. Uh, after just um, a short engagement uh, with, um, with a lot of fortitude, climbing over fences and firing as they went, using that training that they learned over the winter, they uh, pushed the Confederates back. They charged up a hill and eventually uh, pushed the Confederates off the backside of the hill on the outskirts of Lewisburg. Um, about 90 minutes after the initial start of the battle and after about 30 minutes of, of fighting with the entire unit, uh, the Confederates were routed from the field. Uh, the casualties of that engagement were, were pretty varied, anywhere between 40 and 80 killed, uh, wounded about 60 to another 100, and uh, somewhere between 100 and 150 captured. Only 13 men of Crook's command uh, were killed. Um, 53 wounded and seven were captured. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these men new to battle, uh, when they captured the position, started picking up some souvenirs to the great consternation of Colonel Crook, which prevented a much greater victory than he had hoped. Uh, when all was said and done, uh, they had captured about 300 small arms, 25 horses, and four artillery pieces one of which had been used previously by the British Army uh, during the American Revolution that was captured by the colonial uh, forces at the Battle of Yorktown. Um, at the end of the battle, uh, it was about 6.30 a.m., uh, Colonel Clark and the men of the 36th uh, turned around and marched back into the town of, of Lewisburg victorious and just in time for breakfast. At, uh, at some point during the, uh, the service, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, a gentleman who actually worked here at the castle, this gentleman, Nimrod Burke, uh, who was employed by Colonel Clark here at the castle and other times uh, during his, uh, his stay here in Marietta. Uh, Nimrod Burke was, was brought on as a scout. Again, uh, African-Americans were not allowed to join uh, the regular service. Um, in a, in a regular capacity, but um, he was brought on as a scout for Colonel Clark as they started heading over into uh, Virginia. And that was a, uh, a very smart thing to do by Colonel Clark and the other men because Nimrod Burke was born and raised as a free man on the Leo Plantation, which today is the site of the Bull Run Battlefield. Uh, so when they were sent over to join the Army of the Potomac, um, along with, we believe, Nimrod Burke, 
uh, used as a, uh, a, a spy and scout uh, for that particular purpose. Uh, when the, the 36th arrived, they had the perfect man who had a lot of knowledge, uh, who left that area at the age of 16 to move to, uh, to Washington County with the rest of his family. So he had a lot of knowledge of the plantations, the families, and the trains and roads uh, that they would be using. Um, the 36th Ohio was the first unit of their, uh, of their entire force that was sent toward Manassas uh, Junction. Uh, just as the train carrying the 36th uh, passed Stonewall Jackson's troops, uh, Stonewall and his men cut the railroads and any hope of other further reinforcements to arrive with Pope's army. As a result, the 36th was by themselves when they arrived in Manassas. Uh, and fearing that the entire unit would be assigned to some uh, unknown commander uh, who didn't have any background on them, uh, a classmate of General Pope was George Crooks. He was a year uh, behind Pope. He convinced him to use the 36th Ohio as his personal bodyguard throughout the Battle of Second Bull Run. And as such, uh, following the general round, they had the bird's eye view of the entire battlefield that you see here, uh, which was ultimately a disaster and a rout for the Union forces. And the 36th uh, as one of those uh, forces that was not engaged, was used uh, to help stem the tide of the rout and reorganize some of those units on their retreat back toward the capital. When they arrived back, uh, as I said, they, they saw very little action at Second Bull Run. When they arrived back at the Capitol, um, there was a very interesting incident, an unforgettable event for many of the men that occurred on September the 6th of 1862 at 7 a.m., which I'll read for you here. Uh, the regiment, the 36th, left Arlington, marching through Jordansville via the old aqueduct through Georgetown and up the Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, where they halted and stacked arms. The regiment had walked up the avenue with that swinging, springy stride acquired only through drill and much marching. Through dust and heat, the boys marched well in line at route step, attracting market attention from many army and government officials, but also a multitude of citizens. By the time the guns were stacked, quite a gathering had assembled, and upon command break ranks, the boys instantly scattered and vanished. They were right outside of what is today the White House. Uh, I've got a, a contemporary photo showing a, a unit out in front of the White House today on the backside of that. Uh, upon the command uh, from Colonel Crook to break ranks, the boys instantly scattered and disappeared into the, the countryside. Governors Dennison, the gentleman on the left, who was the Ohio governor, and uh, Governor Pierpont, uh, the loyal Virginia governor uh, of Virginia, were calling at the White House and were meeting with Lincoln when they received word that one of the, the great units from Ohio had uh, arrived outside of the front door of the White House. Uh, Lincoln and his two compatriots, the, the governors, uh, went outside to view the regiment and review it. Uh, Colonel Crook advised of their coming as it says here, uh, had the bugles sound the assembly. As if by magic, the men came hurrying in from every direction. Two of the men, uh, which I've discovered is Joe Schofield and Lewis Starbuck of Joe Palmer's Company G, were followed very closely behind by a local policeman from Washington. Uh, one of the two men was carrying a watermelon. The fleet footed boys then reached the gun stacks before the cops could lay their hands on them. And in, an, and in an instant, the melon was dropped and broken into fragments in front of the unions, uh, to which the boys of the 36, without comment, all pointed and started laughing. All the pieces of the melon were quickly cleaned up and the rinds thrown away. The arms were taken by the rest of the men arriving on the scene and proper honors were extended to the visitors. Uh, Mr. Lincoln witnessing the entire episode uh, was said to have been standing and leaning shoulder against the iron railing outside of the White House, 
laughing heartily at this crazy scene of one of Ohio's most uh, impressive units uh, as it was billed to him. Uh, however, during the review process, after all the manual of arms were done, he found out that they were one of the best, best drilled units in all of Ohio. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence, as many others have said, said as well, that the date of the commission of promotion for all of the officers of the 36th Ohio, Colonel George Crook to General, Brigadier General, and Lieutenant Colonel Melvin Clark to full Colonel, dated to that particular day. Unfortunately, these men would not find out of their promotion until after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, just a few days later, uh, as they left Washington and joined up with the Army of the Potomac uh, heading west into Maryland, uh, another incident occurred on September the 12th that really changed the command structure of the 36th permanently uh, and the whole brigade command, really, uh, that involved their brigade commander, Colonel Augustus Moore, um, who uh, is out in the Cincinnati area. Uh, he's the gentleman on the left you see there. Uh, Colonel Moore was captured by some soldiers of uh, Wade Hampton's cavalry uh, when he was racing out to, to check on some pickets. Uh, he unfortunately rounded a bend and ran smack dab into a, a bunch of cavalry soldiers and was quickly captured. Um, the gentleman in the, in the center, uh, Jacob Cox, who would later become Ohio's governor after the war, uh, was the division commander of a little small division called the Kanawha Division. Um, and uh, as a result of, of this changing of all of those things, uh, George Crook, the gentleman on the right, the commander of the 36th, was promoted to brigade commander and Lieutenant Colonel Clark would take over full control of the 36th for the rest of his life. Um, one of the, uh, the details of that particular incident uh, just a couple of days later, on the same day of the start of the Battle of South Mountain on September the 14th, which we'll talk about here in just a second, uh, on that morning, um, Colonel Moore was released. He was given his parole and sent back to Union, line, Union Lines. Uh, he met up with his commander, uh, uh, General Cox, who's there in the middle. And again, he's under strict rules of... of uh, of gentlemanly conduct when you're paroled uh, to not uh, detail a lot of information about the Confederates. Uh, however, when he apparently saw one of the other local brigades heading toward uh, one of the gaps in South Mountain, he replied to his commander, uh, where is Scammon's brigade heading? And when uh, Cox replied that he was heading toward uh, Crampton's Gap, Moore immediately replied, my God, you need to be careful. Again, realizing the, the conditions that he had for his parole, he didn't say anything more, but that warning was all that was needed for Cox, who immediately sent for reinforcements, and those were immediately sent up um, and, and reinforced uh, the entire Union Army heading toward those three gaps in South Mountain. When they arrived at South Mountain on the morning of, of September the 14th, um, Clark and his 36th Ohio uh, fought alongside five other regiments. Uh, They're at Fox Gap, uh, the center of the three gaps in the South Mountain, the Catoctin Mountains there, uh, just three days prior to the Battle of Antietam. Uh, they were following up on the Lost Order uh, for folks that are uh, history buffs and Civil War buffs in general. Uh, even for those that aren't, I would recommend you read up about the Lost Order Number 191, um, the order of uh, battle, the battle plans basically of Lee's army that was lost and found by the Union soldiers who quickly tried to capitalize on that and attack Lee's very separated army. Um, the 36th and those other units uh, fought at Fox's Gap in the, in the uh, as I said, uh, the center part of the mountains, the South Mountains. Uh, about six o'clock in the, in the evening, uh, they were under a very severe fire. Uh, Clark and his men then coordinated an attack along with a, a, another Lieutenant Colonel 
uh, pictured here on the left of the 23rd Ohio Infantry of, a number, of another brigade, Ewing's Brigade, uh, who was on their left. Uh, Clark and, and these other officers ordered a bayonet charge uh, across an open field toward a piece of timber which housed a uh, fence as well as a large amount of Confederates in one of the very uh, heroic charges there at the Battle of South Mountain, uh, crossing a very open field under heavy rifle fire from their front and enfilading uh, fire, which is uh, fire coming from your, from your flanks or your sides, uh, coming from artillery. Uh, they reached the woods, uh, climbed over the fences, and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And even there's documented cases of, of bayonet um, killings um, uh, of some of the Confederates uh, that wouldn't give up the position before they eventually pushed them off the backside of the mountain. And the, uh, the 23rd and the 36th held the position on the top of, of South Mountain for the next two to three hours under very heavy cannonading and repeated attacks to, write, to try to reclaim that per particular position. Uh, but they didn't give it up uh, until darkness fell and the battle was over. Uh, that gentleman on the left, you might recognize the face, uh, the future politician, that's Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, the commander of the, 30, uh, the uh, 23rd Ohio, who was very severely wounded in the arm on that particular charge, along with Clark in the 36th. Um, the gentleman on the right, another member of the, the 23rd who would distinguish himself a few days later at uh, the Battle of Antietam, uh, is William McKinley. So we're now at uh, the Battle of, of uh, Antietam. In the few minutes we have left, we'll, we'll talk about this particular um, this battle and their, their role in the, the ultimate outcome of the battle. Uh, but I will just uh, recommend to folks, uh, we hope to have a future program, uh, maybe on a, a future anniversary, where we go into much more detail on a, a series of lectures to go into more detail about the entire service of, of the 36. But just for folks that are not quite familiar with the entire battle or have not visited the Battle of Antietam, there's really three uh, major engagements at the Battle of Antietam, four if you count uh, the West Woods area, which is in the left part of the screen over here, over near, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the Dunker Church uh, over in this particular area. Uh, but three major engagements. Uh, the, the green engagement you see here is the Miller Cornfield, uh, famous for the, the first three hours of fighting with the Iron Brigade and others going back and forth across the Miller Cornfield. Very, very heavy casualties. Uh, the mid part of the day, uh, the red arrow is the sunken road or the, the bloody lane uh, part of the battlefield. Uh, and then the later part of the engagement, uh, later in the, the blue area down toward the bottom, which is where Clark and the 36th and the Kanawha Brigade, or I'm sorry, the Kanawha Division will be engaged. Uh, on the evening uh, before the battle on September the 16th, uh, there was a heavy skirmishing around this bridge. This is looking from the Union side across the, the Roarback Bridge. Uh, today it's called the Burnside Bridge for the Union commander on the field. Um, there was heavy skirmishing in and around that. Uh, in large part, uh, Captain Hiram Duvall of Company A with the 36 uh, pushed back the Confederate uh, skirmishers back to the wall and eventually over the bridge where they dug in on the opposite side of Antietam Creek where they would start the battle the very next day uh, and kind of look at each other and fire lots of artillery back and forth at each other until they engaged uh, about one o'clock in the afternoon with multiple attempts to get across the bridge very unsuccessfully with a, a number of Georgians in the heights beyond dug in on the hillside, repulsing a series of charges. Uh, Crook, to his great credit as brigade commander, uh, was able to get artillery properly positioned to put maximum fire on the hillside and brought his other men of the brigade, minus the 36 who was held reserve, um, brought him up to this stone wall that you see here in front of you 
and in fact got a couple of companies from one of the units of the brigade across the creek uh, just to the right of this particular picture to start firing down the lines toward the, the, the Roarback Bridge. Uh, just as he had secured the position and was ready to attack and carry the bridge, uh, he reserved that honor for the 36th Ohio. And to their great uh, consternation, all the, the heavy lifting and the, the terrible deadly work to secure that uh, gr glory for the 36th to be the first ones across the bridge as they started down the hillside, uh, two units who had been delayed, uh, the 51st Pennsylvania and the 51st New York, charged across from the left part of the screen here, the left part of this particular picture, and dashed across to great casualties, but great, um, great heroicism and great uh, uh, memories um, for those men of the 51st Pennsylvania and 51st New York, capturing the bridge, and as many of the men will complain, stole the glory of Crook's Brigade. Um, they will ford, uh, some of the, the units will be carrying the bridge in the, the heights beyond. Some of the units of Burnside's uh, Corps will, will cross the footbridge at this red arrow, but Crook and his, his brigade will, will pass the little ford just up to the river, or up, up the creek, I should say, uh, the Antietam Creek will cross where a couple of those other units had gone through uh, previously, including the 36th. Uh, they will then work their way along the creek bank and up this, this rise uh, toward the town of Sharpsburg in the distance. Again, this is another uh, view from the Confederate side showing the stone wall with the green marker there. Um, again, they, they would cross a little bit to the left of this particular picture and continue the attack. Uh, I've done a lot of research on the, the final um, outcome of the battle and particularly the, the mortal wounding of, of Colonel Clark in the, the last attack there at Antietam. Uh, just to the right of this wall, um, there's a, a roadway that you see in the distance, uh, but there's a roadway to the left of this particular photograph that is kind of the high water mark of the attack of uh, the entire Union left flank as they headed toward the, the town of Sharpsburg. Uh, up here in the, in the distance is what's now the National Cemetery uh, on the outskirts of, of Sharpsburg. Um, one of the other... Um, uh, brigade commanders, uh, General Christ, uh, I, I point him out here because his particular um, battle report talked about a very heavy cannonade that fired uh, shots directly on all of the infantry attacking across the fields, uh, coming from right to left, including Clark and his men. Uh, Clark was hit by an unexploded uh, case shot, which I'll show you here at the end of the presentation. We have another real authentic uh, Civil War artillery shell, obviously diffused, uh, but I'll show you that at the end. That's part of our collections here at the castle. Um, but uh, he was killed uh, during the final attack. Uh, as Crook described it, uh, he, he described uh, Colonel Clark's death in this way. About 2 p.m., the charge came and the Union troops found themselves in a hail of bullets. We were met with such a hail of musketry bullets with several batteries dealing death and destruction amongst our ranks that it would seem nothing could survive it. After crossing, crossing the crest of the hill, which would be the crest uh, off to the right of this particular photograph, there's a swale in between the two. After crossing the crest of the hill, the troops descended into a hollow where they found themselves in a crossfire from the enemy. Here, Colonel Clark was struck by a solid, by a case shot, tearing him almost in twain. He died instantly. We were but a short distance apart when this occurred, and the enemy in this field were as thick as blackbirds. Uh, Crook immediately, even though he was the brigade commander, took charge of the, the 36th and continued the charge uh, many accounts, there's probably about nine different accounts that I've, I've discovered talking about Colonel Clark's death, all of them vary slightly. Some saying he lasted as long as five minutes, 
Um, Crook's account said he was killed instantly, uh, but the shell most agree took off both of his legs and he bled out very quickly. Uh, a lot of the accounts will say um, that his final words uh, were, get down boys, uh, as, the, as the shelling started getting very thick and waiting for the, the order to charge. And then after he was hit, go ahead boys, I am killed as they started heading up the hillside and approaching the wall that you see here in the photograph. Um, under the cover of darkness, uh, after the, the attack failed, um, we think from a, a group, I think is probably Bracken's battery of uh, artillery from Fredericksburg, Virginia, that will fire the, the fatal shot based on the, the rounds that many of the men described and the position and their own reports. Um, firing directly down the, the length of the line toward Clark here and Chris and his men to the right. Um, after the, the Clark is killed and the, the attack fails up along the wall, which is near to present day Branch Avenue, uh, just in the nick of, of time, the entire Confederate reinforcement group under Stonewall Jackson, this big, large uh, red arrow will arrive on the left flank of the Union attack and will start uh, crumbling the line and rolling it up from one end to the other. Uh, they immediately halt the attack and start retreating back to their original position on the hillside about in this particular position of the blue arrow, if you, if you see that here. Uh, they didn't leave their fallen commander behind. Uh, men will grab a blanket uh, we'll, we'll put Clark in the blanket and we'll carry him back to the position which they will hold for the rest of their night. Um, they will stay and sleep there on the battlefield uh, the night of the 17th. Again, the bloodiest day in American history, uh, resting amongst the dead and wounded, uh, both Confederate and Union, uh, until relieved the very next morning. If you go there to the battlefield today, um, you'll see this particular marker for the 36th Ohio. On the back side of that, it will state uh, very near this spot, just over the, the rise here in front of you, um, is the, the mortal wounding uh, of uh, Colonel Melvin Clark. Uh, the 36th will be fairly um, uh, lightly wounded and, and light casualties compared to the bloodbath that was Antietam. Um, they had one officer and one man killed. Obviously, that man killed was Lieutenant Colonel Clark um, and another man. Um, they had 21 wounded and two men missing who uh, I believe were probably mortally wounded, um, Hockenberry and, and, uh, and, and another around the, the hospitals after the battle. Again, 23,000 casualties, it shocked the nation. Um, Matthew Brady very famously uh, recorded these uh, photographs which were distributed and really uh, woke up the nation as to the, the bloody consequence of this war. This one taken along the, uh, the Hagerstown Pike uh, up in the, the Miller Cornfield area where Rufus Dawes in the 6th Wisconsin, the Iron Brigade, uh, Dolls becoming a, uh, a local soldier with that group. Um, it really shocked the nation and realized everyone there uh, how bloody the, the conflict was going to be. Uh, speaking of Dawes, I'll, I'll finish the program with this. Uh, the word of Colonel Clark's death was not received uh, of his death at Antietam for, for three days. Uh, on, the on the 20th of September of 1862, uh, word reached Marietta. And it reached it in a kind of an unusual and unfortunate way. Uh, Stephen Newton, the brother of John Newton that owned the castle here, who was also a member of the military committee, came and knocked on the door of the lady here, uh, Sarah Dawes, who lived uh, right across from the uh, Marietta College campus as it, as it stands today. Uh, she was a fellow member of the First Congregational Church with the Clark family and, and good friends with uh, both Melvin and his wife. Uh, Mr. Newton knocked on her door and immediately told her, I have bad news. Well, those that are familiar with the army process of informing loved ones, 
when you see that uh, chaplain or in this case, the military committee member knocking on your door saying he has bad news, her first reaction was her son Rufus, Rufus is dead, to which he immediately apologized uh, and said, no, but Colonel Clark is, and I want you to go with me to talk to his wife. Uh, Sarah, um, being the good friends of the Clark, uh, walked uh, a couple blocks up the street here um, to uh, the house on Washington Street um, and told Mrs. Clark, um, she described it this way, the reality to her was truly terrible. She goes from one in fainting, fainting fit into another. How terrible is her? Unfortunately, she didn't hear another for another three days that her own son Rufus, who saw the bloodbath in the Miller cornfield, that he had survived. Sophia, uh, Melvin's widow now, at the age of 26, uh, moved her family back to Belpre to take care of her blind mother. Unfortunately, two years later, her stepson, Joseph, also went to serve the same cause as his father and lost his life, as I mentioned earlier, uh, outside of City Point, Virginia. Um, Sophia eventually would move on to Mount Vernon, Ohio, to live with her brother and uh, died a broken woman at the age, unfortunately, of 37, to show you the toll that it would take. Uh, Clark's body was brought back to Marietta with great pomp and circumstance. Uh, they held military rights under the command of his former adjutant, uh, Benjamin Fearing, who had returned from the Battle of Shiloh with the, 30, with the 77th and Colonel Hildebrand uh, and was given a new command, the 92nd Ohio, who would perform all the funeral rites for him in nearby Mound Cemetery. Uh, as an ironic side note, the, the 92nd would join the, the 36th as it was transferred to the Western Theater and would serve with it throughout most of the rest of the war down in Tennessee and Georgia uh, on the march to the sea. Uh, today, uh, on this 158th anniversary of the bloodiest day in American history, uh, the great carnage that should never be forgotten in American history, uh, we honor Colonel Melvin Clark, uh, the first owner and builder of the castle uh, that we uh, enjoy and, and use for educational programming still today. Um, we honor his memory along with 900 others from here in Washington County who remembered, are remembered in the civil monument uh, in Muskingum Park in Marietta. And I hope that we will never forget. For as our local cemetery, there's a, a marker for the pioneers uh, just about three blocks from where I'm seated uh, at the present moment. Uh, on that pioneer monument, it says, Name pass, names pass away, but deeds live on. And those names like Colonel Clark and the things that they did for America's country and America's freedom uh, for their fight to make sure that all men, women, and children are free in this country, those deeds are still remembered today. And for that, I thank you all for joining me. At this point, I'll, I'll be glad to take some questions. Yeah, so we have five questions. Uh, I just want to mention if anyone does have to leave, you are more than welcome to uh, hit the uh, leave button at the bottom right hand corner. We do realize it's a little bit past our time, but we'll take those um, questions using the Q&A function. We have five that are already with us. So if you want to answer to ask your questions, go ahead and hit Q&A, enter your question in there and it will be sent off to us. So we have um, one question here from Steve and it says, what was Washington County's population in 1861? Uh, that's a that's a very good question. Um, it's it's about um, there there are about forty five hundred uh, union enlistments. Uh, I believe th this is a male population. There there are about eighty four hundred males living here. So uh, just by a rough half and half, I'm going to guess uh, about seventeen eighteen thousand uh, living in the county. Um, but over half of those will, half of the male population here in the county will enlist in the union cause. 
Um, Judy asks, are there any portions of that very large drill hall that was, uh, that was created? Are there any portions of that left? No, um, not to my knowledge. There, that thing was so gigantic. I can't imagine that it would, uh, any remnants of that would be, would be left. And uh, Debbie asked, did Rufus Dawes, sure thing. Oh, sorry about that. I apologize for that, folks. I forgot to turn on our internal um, um, electrical outlet here. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Debbie asked, did Rufus Dawes ever meet with the 36 as they were both fighting in the same battles? Yeah, uh, t Rufus Dawes would, would certainly have known Colonel Clark. Uh, he also attended the, the Congregational Church as a, as a student. That was a requirement for all of the Marianna College students. And uh, Colonel Clark was a, an active member of that, that particular congregation. The family knew each other uh, very well. But at Antietam, um, the 36 was on a completely different part of the battlefield than Rufus Dawes and the Iron Brigade. Uh, Dawes was on the northern part of the battlefield. Uh, they fought at uh, what was called Turner's Gap at South Mountain. And so they had a different pathway to, to Antietam. Uh, they would have been off to the right of, of Clark's uh, unit at, at Fox, Fox's Gap. And so from there, um, from the South Mountain battlefields, they took two completely different uh, pathways to, um, to cross Antietam Creek and were multiple miles from one another during the engagement. Uh, I will mention, however, uh, another local veteran, uh, a well-known veteran, uh, a gentleman by the name of Adoniram Judson Warner, uh, who was a local congressman along with Rufus Dawes later in life. Uh, both of those men met for the very first time on the battlefield there at Antietam um, the night before the battle on uh, just outside of the Miller cornfield. Uh, Steve asked if Colonel Clark was mounted when he was killed. Yeah, I've only found one um, indication. Um, there, there was one report that said he was mounted. Um, and so the other, the other ones either don't say, I always assumed he was, we, he was on foot, but there was one report that said he was mounted. So Again, if you're riding, you, your, your legs would probably be parallel to one another. And uh, coming from left to right, that, that shell would have, uh, all the reports said it, it sheared, his, uh, sheared his legs off at the upper part of his legs. Not getting too graphic. Um, it, he, he bled out very quickly. The, the, the reason I doubt that he was on, I, I have my doubts on, on the fact that he was riding, however, because there was never any mention of him being taken down from his horse or falling from his horse. So I, I'm leaning more toward the fact that he was, um, was on foot. Okay, it's one of those things just like, oh, I was just gonna mention real quickly, it's, it's kind of like any type of uh, auto accident in modern day time periods. When you have multiple witnesses of an event, you get multiple wildly differing accounts, so. Okay, we have sorry, a time for a last few questions. Uh, Owen asked, why would Burnside allow his forces to be bottled up at the bridge instead of fording at multiple points? Yeah, Bur that's one of those great questions. Uh, many men will um, actually try to, to encourage Burnside to, to ford it uh, right near the bridge and not bottleneck it into the bridge. Uh, in fact, uh, they were looking for fords. Uh, fortunately, Crook and his men found one uh, a little bit um, north of where the bridge was located. Um, but lots of the, the officers were trying to, to force him to do that. Unfortunately, he sent a lot of his troops farther south to find a, a more accomplished ford to get across. It delayed the attacks, uh, which allowed eventually Stonewall Jackson and his forces to arrive in time. The water was fairly deep but it wasn't something that was, I think, impassable um, as many of the other men of his command would argue. Okay, and the last question that we have is from Judy and she asked, can you tell us about the flag that's being held up uh, on screen right now? Yeah, so that particular flag was uh, made by um, uh, 
Catherine uh, Sams, uh, a local researcher here, works at the uh, History and Genealogy Library, uh, who gave that flag to me and uh, the group that's that's here when we went on a field trip there uh, on the 150th anniversary uh, of uh, the Battle of Antietam. We took a, a, a field trip there. Uh, Bill Reynolds uh, on the right and Dan Hinton, who's since passed away, are holding that. It's an exact replica of the, the flag of the 36th, uh, which would have all their battle records on it. it shows Chickamauga, Chattanooga, um, Antietam, and others. Um, but when we visited the graves of some of those, those local soldiers in the National Cemetery who didn't come home like uh, Colonel Clark, he, he was sent home. Uh, most of the others that died, both at South Mountain and at Antietam, were buried in the National Cemetery. So we were fortunate to, to be able to take that replica flag and uh, the groups that, that joined us there uh, were part of a, a special event. And we have that uh, flag as part of our collections here at the castle today. So again, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for their patience. I know I've run a, a few minutes over, but I hope you enjoyed the, the program this evening. And Scott, we have, for everyone, we have one last slide to show. If you want to oh, show this shell, sure. I think that we might have forgotten cool. to do that. Yeah, I, so I'm going to pull up that. the other slide while you do that, if you don't mind. Yeah, let me do. For folks that want to get a, a perspective on how big the shell was that, that killed Colonel Clark, we also have a true Civil War shell, a 10-pounder, uh, which was in all of the accounts, it said that he was, uh, I think there is one that doesn't say a 10 pounder, but all of them were, were pretty familiar with the type of um, artillery pieces that were shooting at them. So this gives you an idea of how big this is. It does weigh 10 pounds. It has uh, metal balls on the inside of it, but when it in contacted Clark, it had not exploded. Uh, basically a solid shot that went through him um, it was defective, but it did its job. Fortunately, it only killed Clark and none of the other men around it, which it was um, intended to do. Okay, thank you, Scott. And just wanted to say thank you to all of us who joined us for our uh, pop-up, our first virtual pop-up talk. Um, we have put into the chat uh, links to make a donation or to, to become a member or renew your membership. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed tonight's talk and might consider doing either or both of those. Um, again, thank you, Scott, for doing this presentation this evening, and we hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, other than that, we will go ahead and close out and hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening tonight. So thank you yeah, very thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone for coming, and I uh, hope you can continue to support us with programmings like this. Thank you. Yeah.